Good evening. It's wonderful to be here with you. Um, this is a really interesting subject, one that I already knew quite a bit about, but as I was preparing for the class, there's an enormous amount of information out there that you can find in a lot of different places. So I hope that if you're interested in this, you will pursue it. In the end, there's a bibliography so that you can actually do more research yourself. But what my plan is today is to give you as much information as you need to be able to at least use names and naming patterns a little more efficiently in your own research in the UK. So we'll start with asking what's in a name. The, the study of names is onomastics or onomatology and any kind of name study falls in that uh, category. But anthroponomastics, it's the study of personal names. So that's what we're doing today is really anthropomonastics. So why do we study them? Why do we study names? It's because patterns of names developed as people wanted to identify people in their families, in their clans, within their within their cultural group and so on. Different cultures have a lot of different ways of naming and carrying on names. I was just reading a book, in fact, uh, today, this morning, about uh, the, South, the Southwestern Indians in the United States, and um, they had some very interesting things. Their names were not, women were not given specific names, they were only given their father's name, and then they had to kind of have nicknames. So these kinds of cultural habits or traditions or patterns go, go from in different countries and different cultures differently. The question that you might have is how can onomastics help in family history research? And there's a lot of reasons why we want to, to know these things, particularly in what we're talking about today, the UK, but in actually in other places too, you will want to study the onomastics of each cultural group or country or ethnic group that you are, are researching. So it doesn't just apply to the UK. Family names are passed down. Not always, it just depends on the case, but they're often passed down and they can give clues to you as a family history researcher to the a person's parenthood or their ancestry or their family line or their clan. The maiden names of family members are often used to associate a group with a different group or if they moved from one group to another, they can be used that way. Place names uh, often are used as surnames in many places, and they can point you to a region of origin of your family. So that can be very useful. Also, if you look at the distributions of surnames within an area, they can also lead you to regions of interest. When you know that a certain name, uh, there are a lot of them in one place and not so many in another place, you might want to start in, in the place where the distribution is higher rather than where the distribution is lower if you're not sure exactly where your family came from. So how did people come up with these names? That's something that I've always been interested in. Why are people named the names they're named? So there are lots of reasons for, for naming people different things. But in, the, in Great Britain, for many, 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 many centuries, uh, they were only four names or given names used with what we call by names or nicknames or patronymic names to kind of differentiate people from one another who had the same names. And in many cultures, there were only a few actual given names, relatively few. Um, at one point in Wales, for example, the predominant names were about 80 different names is all they had. And that makes uh, actually can make family history a little harder. But in the ancient times, they were used, of course, to distinguish you from one another as an individual. They were also used to distinguish clans and family groups from one another. They were used to distinguish people from one region to another. So that's one thing. But also, they often change during people's lifetimes and still do. And we know that because sometimes a person named John might also be named Jack, as in Jack Kennedy. His name is actually John Fitzgerald Kennedy, but he went by Jack. Even as a president, sometimes people called him Jack Kennedy. A lot of times in the ancient world, names had separate meanings in the language itself. And that is still true in some cultures. They use meaningful names. Um, we often, when we name babies, we will go to one of those baby books and find out what our names 
of the babies might mean. Nowadays, a lot of people in particularly the United States and some of our cultural groups in the United States, they're making up a lot of things that or using names in very different ways than we normally have done in the past. So things change. Often names denote religious ideas, personal characteristics or qualities or natural phenomena. Uh, particularly in some ancient cultures, people would be, maybe be called blue sky or something like that as a child. Now in England and the British Isles, particularly in England, but in the British Isles in general, the, the four names, the given names, the four names have their etymology or background in Germanic, often mostly Anglo-Saxon, or Scandinavian languages, in Middle English, in Norman French, Celtic, Gaelic, Hebrew, Greek, or Latin. So you'll have a lot of different etymologies of names. So they may mean different things than you might expect, even because they might have come from a language you didn't expect. Now, in England, of course, in modern times, there are a lot of Indian people there, Asian people, and African people. So you'll have a lot more like from the 1900s on, particularly, you'll have a lot more different etymologies of the names. Um, names change over time from, from the 1500s till now. Many names are the same, but many of the names have changed and, and many of them become nicknames by names or been adopted in different ways. So if you can't find a record, particularly in the older times in the 19th centuries and before, if you can't find a record for a person under the name that you think it is, Look for the original name, find out what that, if it's a by name or a, a nickname, like Molly and Mary, for example, Molly is a nickname for, for Mary or Polly sometimes. And so there are lots of different nicknames that people used and they may even be on a record. So if you can't find a record with the original name, look for the nickname or a by name. If you can't find a record in the by name or the nickname, look for the original name that it would have come from. Now, there are also surnames, of course, and those were adopted fairly late. European surnames were mainly started to be created in the 11th century, and they came up with some pretty funny names sometimes. They would call themselves Pigman or, you know, just different things be depending on what they uh, wanted to do. As particularly, that's true in French and Belgium because they were forced to take a surname. They didn't sometimes want to, so they picked the worst, awfulest surname they could pick. But they started to uh, adopt them around the 11th century when there got to be a lot more people around. And so they wanted it to individualize themselves a little bit more. Even in England, um, it was later, it was in the 12th century, but even in England, the, those surnames in after the 12th century did not become really settled until about the 15th century. And even then, in Wales, for example, they didn't start using surnames really until late, around the 1700s or even later. Surnames in England and the British Isles, but particularly in England, but in the British Isles in general, they were often derived from given names. So they would take a given name and that was maybe a patronymic name and turn it into a last name, Johnson, for example. They were also derived from locations where the person lived by own personal family name is Hicken, but that originated as Higgin, Higginbotham, which was taken from a, the name of a location, which was named after a man named Higgs. That, that's at least what we, what we think the etymology of that is. So if you have a location name, it could be named after a hill or a valley. Botham means valley. It could be a place name like Cambridge or Oxford whatever, where the person lived. It could come from their occupation. Smith is one of the most common names in England. And that comes from the occupation, of course, of being a person who worked with metal. Sometimes from status, Earl, maybe a last name, something like that. Nicknames, patronymic names are very common. Matronymic names are sometimes common, particularly in Welsh names. Personal descriptions, Mr. Red, Mr. Brown. Um, may have something to do with their eyes or their hair or their color of their skin, or just simply the vagaries of the human mind. The Welsh themselves did not adopt surnames until well into the 1700s, and that's true in some places in Ireland, also in, in really rural Scotland. Let's look at English names then. English given names were very important because they often had to do with family or community connections. So they used surnames as first names. They used 
maiden names, of surnames or place names as first names sometimes. Maiden names could be middle names. This is later on in the 1900s, 1800s, I mean. The middle name of a parent could be a first name. Mostly that was in the 18th to the 20th centuries. And they often called their children after recently deceased family members. Biblical names were very popular, particularly after the uh, Reformation. And it was very popular for nonconformists, particularly to name their children in biblical names. So if you have in the 1800s or 1700s, even the 1600s, a, a child who's named with a biblical name, it could be a Jewish person, which is fairly rare, but could be, or it could be more likely to be a non-Anglican, uh, someone Roman Catholic, perhaps, or a non-conformist religion, like the Quakers or other people. They were named after virtues, like faith, hope, and charity, for example. They were named after classical names, like Roxana or Alexander, classical heroes, even Achilles, you'll find that occasionally, things like that, really Greek uh, and Latin names. Um, they were named after royalty, for example, in the 19th century, when uh, Victoria was made the queen, there were thousands of children, girls named Victoria. And when she got married to Albert, there were thousands of children named Albert all of a sudden. And when they named their child Duncan, their middle name Duncan, which is actually a Scottish name because Victoria loved Scotland. Many, many kids were named Duncan all of a sudden. So it it can be very interesting to look at the actual that may not even have anything to do with their family name. Flower names became particularly popular at the end of the 19th century for girls. And you need to look at godparents' names when you look at, if you if you can find the godparent or the witness. Now, often witnesses were not related. So sometimes that doesn't work because they would just pay somebody a couple of pennies to be their witness if they didn't have a family member or godparent. But particularly in the in the Catholic Church and the Anglican Church, the High Anglican Church, um, before 1700, particularly, children were often named for their saints' day if they were Catholic. And if they were not, they would be named for a godparent. But that actually hung on for quite some time. So it could be that a godparent would uh, be the person who was who was giving them the name. They could give them their own name or they could give them a name that was important to the godparent. So that actually means something too. Another thing that came up were fads. So especially in the 1800s, you'll find a lot of names from uh, the Celtic revival when during the time when they were looking backwards into the past, Bronwyn, Cecilia, Allen, Carey, names like those. The medieval craze from the 1848s with the pre-Raphaelites uh, brought in names like Bertram and Bayard, which are kind of old names for like in the Carolingian period. They would name them after actors, famous actors. They would name them after movie stars. They would name them after writers. They would name them after literary characters. So there's all kinds of uh, different names. So you have to be a little bit careful. Again, not every child would be named after a family name. However, there would be friends of the family. Uh, and that could be, as I said, witnesses, godparents, even neighbors sometimes. So when you're on the census, make sure you look at around the census uh, names around in the in that neighborhood from several pages in front to several pages behind, you might find uh, the neighbor that the person was named after, which could lead you to other things because oftentimes neighbors married uh, each other's children. British naming patterns were followed, and I will talk about the naming pattern later, but they were not always followed, particularly after the 1800s, not even after the 1700s as much. However, with that caveat, it is worth a shot to use to look at the naming patterns because particularly in Scotland and somewhat in Ireland and other places in Britain and more in the rural areas, that adherence to those naming patterns could be really a lot more uh, likely. Now, as far as children in the same family having the same name, that did happen. And you, if you've done much research in, in Britain, you will see that in the same family, children having the same name. And you, and if you're not careful, you'll miss a second child because you'll either think they're the same person or you'll think they're in a different family or something like that. So be really careful because they did have same names. 
most often it was if a child had died and then they would name the child after that child that had died. I heard once in a class at Roots Tech that in the very olden days um, that would happen because if they had already used a name, the priest would not charge them a fee for that name. I don't know if that's true or not. I have never been able to verify that. But it's kind of a cool thing if it is true. But anyway, that's that's what they would do. So if the child has the same name, um, it could be that the child had been born and died. In the eastern countries, how in the eastern counties, however, it was considered bad luck to name a child after a dead child or living parent. So if you're working over in the eastern counties, over you know on the along the coast by France, maybe not so much. Uh, they wouldn't have done that so much. However, that also being said. They, I have seen, and it is true, that children in the same family can be given the same name, even if they didn't die. So don't automatically assume that the child has the same name and one of them died. Um, you have to kind of be careful with that. Now, there is also, we, we often think that parents would be logical person for someone to name their child, but that is not necessarily true either. So there was a common superstition that a child, or at least the first child born to a couple, should not be named after a living parent. So if you do find a child named after a parent and you don't know when the parent died, it is possible that the baby was born after the father died, for example. So that's something to check into if you don't know dates on deaths. However, that's yeah, it's pretty common, but I would say it's one of those kind of things that you just keep in the back of your head. There, people did not use middle names as a general rule before the 19th century in England, particularly. Before that, middle names were not middle names in other in other regions in the UK. They were patronymic names or other clan names or by names. So, uh, middle names, however, did become very common during the late 19th century because there were so many people with the same name that they decided to start differentiating. So that's when it started to happen. As far as illegitimate children are concerned, I have seen many times illegitimate children, they are, they are on particularly the civil registers, but in the parish registers as well. They will be given the mother's maiden name. It doesn't even matter if they know who the dad is. They will be given the mother's maiden name on the parish record almost always, and they will be given the civil record in the GRO, you will find on the on the years where you can get those names, you will find that there will not be a maiden name listed oftentimes, which means that it's the same as the child's name. Now, that's not always, always true, but it is probably 97% of the time it's true. So if you find a mother's name, that means the child's mother was undoubtedly married to the child's father. However, if an illegitimate child was then adopted, like the mom got married and he was adopted by the stepfather as his own child, which is not necessarily a legal thing. It just, he just took the father's name. He would use, oftentimes the, uh, the illegitimate child would use his mother's surname as well. So you can find them under different names, the mother's surname, as well as the stepfather's surname, surname or if the mother married his own father, you can find them under the father's name. I've seen also illegitimate children who adopted their stepfather's name past the mother's name. He would use the mother's name continually, not stop doing that, but he would also use the stepfather's name and pass that whole name on to his children. So they might have two, they weren't hyphenated, but they would have two names. All the kids would have those two names kind of as a middle name and a, a step as a, the stepfather's name as their, their surname. Now, twins are really interesting in England because they could do a lot of different things with twins. So they they might name their kids uh, the with names starting with the same letter, boys and girls. They might have the same last syllable in their name, Ina, Ina, for example. Uh, twin names from mythology like um, Remus, Romulus and Remus, for example, might be one they could use. They would might spell their names two different names, but they would be actually the same name. One of them would be spelled backwards and the other would be spelled forwards. So you'd have two different names. They could have names with the same meaning, but they would be in two different languages and they could even have the same name. So that is possibility that you, you might have twins 
if you have two children with the same name and they're born on the same day, uh, you might find that they're actually twins. So be careful with that as well. Catholic children will have the Latin name written on their record, particularly in the olden times in the records before civil records started being to be taken. That means that if they were called, for example, Johannes, that will not be the name that you'll find on most of the other records. You will only find that on their birth record, but that name was probably never used. He probably was called John. And that is true of the almost all those Latin names that you'll see. You will also find those occasionally Latinate names on the high church names, um, the Latinate England, Anglican church. Uh, they still used a lot of Latin in the Anglican church. Okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Jewish names because although the Jews have a very kind of awful history, just like they did everywhere else in England, it's very interesting and it actually was quite influential in certain ways. So the Jews came to England and particularly Scotland quite early. The first written record of a Jewish settlement dates from the 1070. Then that settlement continued until Edward I kicked them out in 1290. It was the Edict of Expulsion. After the expulsion, there was no like openly Jewish community left in England for a long time. There were still Jews there that practiced Judaism secretly, though. And if they're, if you're looking way back in there and you can find records, then you might, and you'll actually see that even later on. If they have a biblical name, they may actually be Jewish. Um, so if you have Jewish ancestry in your DNA, for example, and you're wondering where it is, it could be that, you know, find a, a family that has Jewish type names and you may find them there. When Oliver Cromwell uh, came in, then there, there were Sephardic Jews allowed to practice openly. That was in London, and they were mostly Sephardic Jews. That was in 1656, and they were allowed to remain. So after that, there, was, there, there were Jews in England. Now, Jews were not treated very well, however, for the next 200 years or so. And so they actually passed laws in 1829 and 1858 to kind of stop discriminating against Jewish people. And then Benjamin Disraeli, who was the prime minister twice, he, he was born a Sephardic Jew, but he converted to Anglicanism. So the history of the Jews in Scotland goes way, way back to at least the 1600s. And they were Ashkenazi Jews. So Jews today in Scotland would mostly be of the Ashkenazi background. So if you have Ashkenazi background in your British, you know, you see that in your British DNA, they may be in Scotland. And um, they mainly settled in Edinburgh, and then they settle in Glasgow uh, in the mid-19th century. Now, I'm not going to get too high into these Jew Jewish naming patterns, because it's not that important, but it's there is kind of interesting because they did have a progression of son, then grandson, then so Ben meant son of, and then they would put tack on the end of it. They would put where the person came from. So their grand grandparent would be, this is where they came from. And then if they had like a priestly family name, then they would give the priestly family family name. So you can see that Moshe. The Kohane, he had a priestly family name, but he was from London. So sometimes you will see also mother's rather than father's name if the mother was more important than the father in some way. I gave you some books here that you can take a look at if you do have Jewish ancestry in, in England or Scotland. Um, this is kind of interesting, but just take a look at it. I'm not going to really talk about it, but there were alternating names. So alternating names in the royalty. So if you have if you go back to Scottish nobility, the Scottish nobility particularly had a lot of Jewish influence. And so it's in this book, When Scotland Was Jewish, they would alternate the names. Now, this is Scottish names. Of course, the Scottish are Gaels. And so so they, they actually did speak Gaelic. And there were some interesting things about Scots. So Scots and Irish are basically the same peoples, and the Scots came from Ireland. So Scottish names and Irish names can be quite similar. 
they both use patronymics, and I'll talk about this a little bit more in this in the Irish name section. They use patronymics. That is, the children took their father's name as a by name. It's not a surname. It's a by name. So they would say the name of the person, and then they would have Mac or Mick with with no A, and then the name of the father. They also use Fitz after the Norman French. Um, the Norman French use Fitz, so they would also sometimes use Fitz. So Fitzgerald, for example, is a Scottish name. If you were a daughter, you would use the, the prefix Ingian. So you would have the, the girl's name Bridget Ingian, daughter of whatever the dad's name was. The boys would have a clan name attached. So Mac MacDonald, or which oftentimes clan names are places. The girls did not, though. So you won't find that attached to girls. In the Highlands, particularly, they had a clan name, a by name, and a sep name. The sep name was a smaller family group, usually within the clan. And so if you had, if your Scot Scottish uh, ancestry comes from the northeastern part of Scotland, from the borders and from the West Highlands, you're going to have by names. And if you come from the Highlands, you'll have probably a set name associated with your with your person's name. There are lots of Danish, Norwegian, and Norman names in Scotland. And they also started to adopt English names, particularly in the lowlands in the early 17th century. So, you know, you can't count on a Scottish name if you have a Scot. The Irish moved to Scotland in 1840s. They brought their names with them also. Surnames in Scotland did not really begin to take place or take hold until the 16th and 17th centuries. And then they started dropping their patronymics or adapting their patronymics into names like MacDonald, for example. Now in Scotland, if you look at the etymology of the names, some of the surnames when they started to adopt surnames were based on animals. Some of them were based on church terms, like if a person was part of the priestly class in Scotland, they might have a name with a, with a G-I-L and a Gil, which is a priestly, it, ref, it references priests. And then women's names, they would sometimes feminize their male names in the 19th century, so they put Ina on them, a lot of them. The Catholic people in, in Scotland, there still were some Catholics in Scotland, even though mostly they were nonconformists. But Catholic confirmation names were used in Scotland quite late, actually. And they didn't necessarily put those in the records. Catholics were kind of underground for a long time. Um, but they still were often used, so you might find them as a middle name. And that might indicate that they were Catholic, so you might want to look in Catholic records. Many Irish names uh, appeared, like I said, after 1840. They're similar to the Scottish names because they're, they're Gaelic names. Now, Irish names are quite similar in many ways to the Scottish names because, like I said, they're the same, same group of people. They just lived in different places. So the Irish also used patronymics, and so they didn't have settled surnames either until the 16th and 17th centuries. The Irish would use O. Now, you don't find O, although it is there. You don't find O as often in Scotland, but it is there. O meant the grandson of a person. So you don't find it in Scotland very often because they didn't use that grandson thing. They used mostly father's patronymics. But the O means grandson or descendant of, and the Mac means the son of. Fitz was in use also in Ireland. Now, a lot of people say Mac means Scott, O means Irish. That is absolutely not true. My McDonald's came from Ireland and they came from Ireland. They were not Scottish. They did move to Scotland and move back. So if you were a woman, it replaces the O with knee, which I can't say those because they're, <laughs> I don't, I don't speak Gaelic in young, you we, uh, descendants daughter and Mac is replaced with Nick. So you'll find those sometimes in surnames that, that N I or N I C You'll find those sometimes in surnames, so be aware of that. That's where they came from. So you might look back, back, back. Now, at one point in England, they passed a law that forbade the use of Owen Mac, which was very unfair if you ask me. But 
not everybody went along with that. So what they could do is they sometimes change the name. So the form might be a different name than the original name, but it would be similar. So check and see if there's a form of that name that might have the O or the Mac in it, if you're going backwards. That was fairly, I think it was in the 1700s. I'm sorry, I didn't write that down, I think. Roman Catholics would normally, well, maybe not normally, but almost normally, drop that Mac or that O because it didn't, they didn't want to use that, but they would adapt a name. So like they would take the Mac and just put it in with the rest of the name and make it into a different name. So for example, Macalbrigid is Macalbrigid. <laughs> and um, you could you can sometimes see more an og in a name um, because like if there were two people in the same family with the name. So if you see this anywhere, uh, more means big, og means little, or big means little and sometimes can be used in Og. So if you see that in a by name particularly, um, then it would probably mean that one of them was a son and one of them was the elder. Sometimes you'll see uh, by names with, with colors of hair, red-haired Patrick and so on. Now those became, they would actually become real names. So the reason I'm talking about by names is because they will become real names when they've been used extensively somebody might pass it on to a kid. So you want to know these are by names, these by names sometimes. Uh, the surname stability in Ireland was not as common. So things could change very quickly within the same family even. There might be many different versions of the same name. And in Ireland, Roman Catholicism lasted for a long, long time and is still there. So you will find those Latinate forms of the um, of the names in the Latin records, in the Latin Roman Catholic records. And be aware that nicknames are important because they were used um, and could could come from, again, Molly from a, a, a real original name. Traditional names are still used actually in Ireland. They're kind of going back in time that way. And those are the Gale Talk names. Those are the first name, followed by the father's name, followed by the name of the paternal grandfather. And that's a traditional pattern in Ireland. You will see it in some places in Ireland still, but it was used quite extensively in Ireland uh, earlier on. They might not necessarily use the Mac and the, uh, you know, those other prefixes. They may not use those. So be aware of that. Irish. Gaelic names may be anglicized. A lot of those anglicized names were adopted in England. So just because you find an Irish name in, in an English family does not mean that they came from um, Ireland necessarily. Some names can be both male and female. So be really careful with that because Florence, for example, is a male name and a female name. And so if you find a Florence, you have to look for the nickname Flurry instead of Flory. All right. Nicknames. Uh, I already said that. Okay, so good. So we will move on. And here are Welsh names. Welsh were very, very, very proud of their names. So they used patronymics very late. It meant something to them. Their patronymics meant a great deal to them. And so they were very important and they did not want to give them up. And so they didn't give them up until late in the, in the 18th centuries and early 19th centuries. So still, even up until the 1820s, you will find patronymics in certain places in Wales. In Wales, the prefixes were, they, they spoke Celtic. So it's a little bit different from the Gaelic. They're similar languages that I think they came, you know, in the long, long ago, but the Welsh, Welsh spoke uh, Welsh, which is a uh, Celtic name, uh, language. So their names were, prefixes were Mag, Map, and Ab, Mab, and those dropped the M a lot of times and became Ap or Ab, meaning son of. So if you see a name that starts with a B or a P with an Ap or an Ab, or even with a map or a mab, if that's surname, then you can be fairly sure that it might be a, Pritch, a Welsh name like Pritchard, for example, 
Um, now, don't get too wrapped up in that because it isn't always true. With that, B, well, the BRP has to be attached to a given name, so be careful of that. That's what I'm saying. Women retain their maiden names in wells, so they're not going to have their husband's names. He didn't have a name that's a surname, so they didn't attach that name to them. The male ancestors' names could be added up to six generations back. So if you go way back in wells and you've got a really long name, the reason is that that's their grandfather, great-grandfather, great-great-grandfather, great-great-great-grandfather, and so on, six generations back. So the reason they did that, they, like I say, were very, very proud of their ancestry. And so the, that can be so helpful because you will find, if you find a, na a name like that, you can pretty much be sure that that was their ancestry, their pedigree. Women's names were also patronymic. They used virch or furch. They shortened it to vich or viz or ach and itch. So if you see that in a name, it means it was a, a matronymic name. Sometimes you'll see it as ch in the beginning. So if you see that at the beginning of a name, a ch, Chalmers, for example, Sometimes those kind of names can also be matronymic Welsh names that came from a matronymic name or patronymic name. Less common patronymic names can be lo very localized, actually. So if you find a really odd Welsh name and you see quite a few of them, if you look for that name in a, sur in a surname distribution, you may be able to find a place where your ancestors actually came from in Wales because they are very localized. They didn't move around a lot in the early times. And um, so you can sometimes find a modern bearer with a name and then follow that name back to a specific locale in Wales. They loved nicknames. So everybody would have at least one by name and people often, even after they adopted surnames did not know the person's surname. So they would call them by a by name. For example, they made jokes of their by names. Evan Stretchum was an undertaker's by name. <laughs> so sometimes you'll see those by names actually and think that they might be a surname, but they're probably not. They're probably just a by name. So be careful of that as well, and especially if they're funny in Welsh. The Welsh have a very funny sense of humor, as I know, because I had Welsh ancestors and my grandpa would keep you rolling on the floor. There were relatively few Welsh given names and surnames, as you might remember. Um, so it's kind of makes Welsh ancestry difficult to follow. There were probably any number of John Joneses, for example, in any Welsh town at any given time. So it's a little bit difficult. And they rarely use middle names once they gave up their patronymics. They just didn't do it. If you find a middle name in an American Welsh person, the chances are they adopted that in the in the 19th century. The chances are they adopted that name themselves when they came to the United States. They would have probably not had that name on a record in well in Wales. Um, if you see alias on a record, this is often used in Welsh records. If you see alias on a record, you can sometimes see that also in English records. It can either be a maiden name. It can be the husband's name. If she had a previous husband, it could be a previous husband's name. So alias doesn't mean that they took on a second name to hide a crime or something. It just means they had a different name that they sometimes went by. Late in the 19th century, uh, you might see men with an extra name that's hyphenated. And it's usually or often, not always, but it's usually their mother's surname. So I've seen that before with an Evans hyphenated Davies, for example. Uh, they didn't usually pass that on to their children, but they may. And if they pass it on to their children, it's often as a middle name and not as their surname. So the actual surname would be Davies and the Evans would be used as a middle name. Oh, sorry. Okay, so Manx names are on the Isle of Man, of course. So most of you probably won't have Manx um, ancestry, but it's kind of interesting. So even if you don't, I hope you enjoy this a little bit. Manx is a Goidelic Celtic language, and it is one of several languages that are spoken on the islands. 
in the British Isles. And they those languages didn't change a whole lot because they were insular. So they still speak Manx. It's one of the, it's actually one of the languages that is an official language on the Isle of Man. There were relatively few given names from uh, the Manx language. Most of them are Gaelic instead of Celtic. The patronymic names that they used were from the Mac prefix until the 17th century. In this case, in the Manx names, they the M-A dropped out and just left the C. So you would have K or Q, C, K or Q as part of the surname. So if you see names that have a kind of an odd look to them, they might be a, a given name with a C or a K or a Q. Oftentimes that might be a Manx name. So lots of the Manx names, that might be a, a traditional Manx name from the Gaelic. This is the Cornish names. Cornish also had their own little way of doing things. So they derived their place names from, or their names from place names. Okay, so they, they loved their places in Cornwall. So if they had a given name, it would generally be English, but they may have changed it into more of a Cornish form. So it would be different, a little bit different maybe from the regular English name. Surnames were patronymic. They came from the patronymic uh, prefixes and they used all these different prefixes. So if, if you see those prefixes, kind of know that they may have actually come from Cornwall. And all the, uh, the British knew this. And so there's like even rhymes about Cornish names in which prefixes meant Cornish names. So they knew that, that that was something that they did. The patronymics names dropped out around the 17th century and became these uh, other names with these prefixes attached to them. Now we're going to talk about the naming pattern. So the British Isles, and this is not just England, it's not just Scotland, it's not just Ireland, the British Isles in general, even in Wales, this would happen to a certain extent. They used this naming pattern. And there, there are two. One is called the parental and the other is called the ancestral. They didn't call them that, we call them that. So I'm first of all going to give you some cautions, okay? Be aware, the same pattern applies to most British and Irish and Scottish, British, Scottish, Irish cultural groups. Starting with the earliest records from the 1500s to the 1900s, you will find these. In the 1500s, we didn't have any kind of surname, so you're not gonna find this in the in the others uh, so easily because, well, there aren't any for the first in the first place. The later uh, that you go in the in in the centuries, the less likely the pattern will occur as it's outlined, as I'll show you how it goes, okay? So you might find it often, often in the, say in the 1600s, 1700s even, but in the, in the 1900s, it may still apply, but it will have probably changed considerably uh, and may not even may not even be something that happened. If you're living, if your ancestors were living in a, a very small area or in a patronymic culture area, the pattern probably is not as important. And that's one one reason is that the name pool is so small. In Wales, at at one point uh, in the late 1700s, in some rural areas, there were only 80 to 85 names that were predominant in the area for boys. So if you were passing on a name down and down and down and you only have that small name pool, then you're gonna have a lot of people with the same names. So the pattern is not gonna be that beneficial in a place like that where there are very few names and they get passed on and get passed on and get passed on. The third thing is anticipate anomalies because even back when it was really pretty well known and followed, it does not mean that it's gonna be strictly followed unless sometimes in royalty or nobility, you'll see it more often because that meant something that was important to them. But anticipate anomalies. 
things are going to be different. They might have named somebody after a, a relative who died or a godfather or something like that. So things are it just, it's not ever, I don't think I've ever seen it like one, two, three, everything is exactly right. Don't jump to conclusion based solely on the names or the pattern of names. Never jump to conclusions anyway in genealogy. Make sure that if you do come up with a hypothesis, not a conclusion, research, 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 use your evidence. That's the key. The pattern is only a tool. It is not a thing to rely on. And lastly, but not least at all, be very careful not to confuse people with the same name on your family search tree particularly, but on your own tree too. If you do that, it's going to make you crazy. It's going to make other people crazy and things will just get all mixed up and messed up. So I've seen it so often that you, people will find a name. They'll think it's in the same area. Oh, here's my guy. And they'll put him in to a family that is not even theirs. Doesn't have anything to do with theirs. Use the pattern to do that as well. Okay. If they don't fit at all in the place where you think they might fit in the pattern, then check it out and see if the pattern has been followed in the rest of the family. And if it has, well, maybe this person was named after another person or maybe they don't belong. So just be a, be very, very careful. Okay. So that being said, this is the pattern on the left. Okay. So on the left is the general parental naming pattern. And it's pretty easy. The first son was named after the paternal grandfather. The second son was named after the maternal grandfather. The third son was named after the father. The fourth son was named after the eldest uncle on the father's side. The fifth was named after the second eldest paternal uncle on the father's side. Or it could be the oldest maternal uncle that depended. And then it goes the same way for the girls. Maternal grandmother, paternal grandmother. Mother, maternal aunt, second oldest maternal aunt or paternal aunt, aunt of the father. If there's no sister, if there's no, uh, if there are like two names that are the same, they might move to the next position on the line or they might just name them something else. So be aware of that. The Scottish pat pattern was also ancestral. So they might have, instead of having the third and fourth son named the way the paternal pattern goes, they might have the third, fourth, and fifth, son, sixth sons. Those would be named after the great grandparent or the daughter. So they would be named after the great grandparents. And then after that, it would go to the great, great grandparents' names. So, and that, that happened. So you might find that occasionally in the Scottish names. Now, be aware, like I've said before, they might be named after a friend, a godparent, another family member, particularly if somebody just barely died. So if you if you know that somebody's name is out of order, look for a, a relative with that name who died recently. They could uh, name them after a brother or sister who had previously died, as I mentioned before. So they didn't necessarily follow the pattern all the time, especially after the third son was born. After they've named the child after the father or the mother, then they might not follow it at all anymore. It might just be gone. So don't get fooled into that. It's especially helpful to use this pattern if you are looking for parental lines or if you want to figure out who is who and you have several people with the same name. So that's what this is mainly used for this nice pattern. So all the many things that I've told you before in this class can actually be used to help you in your genealogy um, if you're if you're doing certain things. This one is is actually one of the more helpful things that you'll find. So I'm going to show you how to use it. So this is how it works. Now I I could have done this on on my own, but I didn't want to go backwards and have to search through everything in mine. So I just took it out of the out of a really great blog that she had done a really great table. So this is how it works. So if you find somebody and you don't know who of several different people he is, so I call them the suspected individuals. The first thing you wanna do is every suspected individual you have, you're probably gonna wind up doing this with, but Find the one that you think might be your person first, if you can. If you can't, then do it for everybody. 
So start with the oldest known generation of a person. So if you know his parents or her parents, that's where you're going to start. So start with, if you know the grandparents, then start there too. Uh, but usually it's not going to go that far back. You're going to be able to find maybe the parents and do it for the parents. But so start with that child. Okay. So you have John and Betty, you can see married in 1821 here. Now they had a bunch of kids. You can see they had a lot of children. And so you would expect that the, the first son would be named William after the paternal grandfather. And the second son would be named George after the maternal grandfather. And the, the third son would be named John. Now, in two cases that happened. In the other case, see how they reversed the order? Now, it is possible that the paternal brother died just before this baby was born. And so they might have named him Samuel after that uncle. And then the next child named John after his their father, John. Okay, so you can see how that works now. You've got the fifth son was named after a father's uncle. So that's that's this kind of in the pattern there. But it's not the maternal uncle. It's actually the father's uncle. So again, don't always rely on this. The sixth son was just named Richard. Who knows where that came from? And the same with the girls. Okay, they had a reverse order as well. So be aware of that type of thing. Now, since you know that in the pattern... William should possibly be the paternal grandfather's name of this child, William. Then you look for Williams with that might. And then you also, if you know that Sarah or Elizabeth, in this case, you didn't know that Sarah or Elizabeth could be the mom's name or Harriet could be the mom's name. Then you start looking for moms and dads who are the grandparents of these kids who have those names that might be expected. Okay, so do you see how that works? It's pretty cool. And it can help you a great deal. Put them, write these out. You can put them in a, in a spreadsheet like this one is, or you can print them on graph paper. You can print out pedigree charts. You can write them in hand, written pedigree charts. Anything you can do to do this is, is what you're going to do. And you're going to do this for all the families you have with no names. This happened to me. I had six Henry Potters and they all, except for two of them, married a woman whose name was Mary. I actually was able to find the last names of the Marys, but I couldn't figure out which one was mine. They were all born within three years of each other and they all lived within three miles of each other. Now, what in the world am I going to do? Who is my Henry Potter's dad? So making this kind of a list for all of them, I found parents, parents, parents. I found a list for all of them. I knew which one was my Henry. However, I didn't know who his parents were. So doing this with his children, I found his parents. And then I found his wife's parents as well because I knew the children. Now they weren't all, all of my Henry Potter's kids did not fall into this pattern, but enough of them did that I again was able to do this and find who my person was. So when you compare all the families with those known names, and you have to sometimes take some, some pretty long time to find all the names and put them in the, into the tables, keep your notes so you know which names you've looked for and which names you've found and where you found them then you choose your most likely guy. So I chose my li most likely guy. I'm pretty sure this is my guy and then did my best research going backwards on him, on all the members of his family going back, back, back. Now, when you do that, that should be also helpful, okay? Because you'll find the pattern possibly in other member families. Keep good records of your research. Make sure that you write everything down I personally, this is how I do research like this. I use a spreadsheet. I keep a spreadsheet on each family. I put a different page within that spreadsheet for each person in the family. I use that as my research log. And also then I can glom them together and then do my comparison. Then after you've got that research done and you're pretty sure 
analyze the names, analyze the dates, analyze the locations in comparison to all the other suspected individuals. If you have to do more research on your other suspected individuals, then do it. Then you draw a conclusion based on the evidence that you have. Always draw your conclusion on the evidence, okay? This is not particularly evidence per se. It only points you in a direction of evidence, okay? So don't draw the conclusion based on the table. Draw the conclusion based on the evidence that you have compiled in all those family names. Then when you figure it out and you're pretty dang sure you're right, share your finding in your tree. Then you can put it in your tree, whether it's your personal tree on ancestry or whether it's in family search. I always like to share everything in family search. That way people don't get messed up because I figure I'm not always right. I make mistakes, but I try as hard as I can not to. So pretty much things I put in, I figure are going to be accurate and I can give reasons why I think they're accurate because I've kept good notes. I have good research. I have good evidence. I have lots of records and at least I have analysis records that I can put in as well. Okay. So I put notes in the notes section. If it's an important note, I make an alert note out of it in family search. And I put notes in the comments and discussion sections on the sources, as well as in the in the person's uh, on the person's profile page. Jerry, yes. we have a question. Is uh, let's see, is a, is there a way to get a copy of your spreadsheet naming pattern? Is should you just tell them to use the website? Okay, so Under let me show you my bibliography, and and that might help. Okay, so the one that you should probably look up if you want to see uh, the spreadsheet type thing is Janice Heppenstall. Okay, oh. so that's. That's the English ancestors right there, um, Heppenstall Janice. And that one is the one that I got this, this page from, okay? And she, she explains this all in really, really detail. And she's got three blogs about it. So you can find, um, you can find that under English Naming Traditions. The other links are under that. So you can find this on there. So I just use this regular spreadsheet and I just, put the names at the top and then I put different categories of dates and places and names and, and then just go through and just add everything, you know, different sources where I found things and just go through and add all the information that I can find on each person on a spreadsheet. That's how I do it. Some people can, some people I know use pedigree charts for that and it works just fine. And you can actually print out the pedigree charts on family search. So that's another way to do it. You know how to do that. You go to the tools and you click on print and it will bring up different the different pedigree charts that you can print. Some of them you can print with sources, the uh, family group records you can print on sources. The other thing you can use are those family group records. Those are actually really good too. So either one will work. Pedigree charts, family group records from family search or your own. I like my own because then I can put my own you know, notes and things on it. And it makes more sense to me, but it's just oh, up to you. Uh, where can they get your handout? Do you have a handout? Okay, my handout will be on the BYU family history okay. webpage. Okay. So if you go there and you go, go to this class, it will have a handout. And my handout actually has more information than not about necessarily about the general pattern, although I might add some more, but it does have more information about the names. So I left out some things or I just, you know, on, on these, cause I didn't, I didn't want you to have to read a billion things while I was talking. So my handout's a little bit more detailed. All right. The bibliography here is if you are interested in the names. Now, a lot of these books that I put on here have lists of names. So they have actual lists of, of surnames, forenames, uh, sometimes by names. So take a look at some of these books, because if you're looking for a name and you wonder, is this a Scottish name? Is this a Gaelic name? You can go to these uh, these lists of names and you will find the, the etymology of the names. So these are really, some of these are really, really good for that. Some of them are just general information about how to use names or the naming pattern or that kind of things. 
but I would definitely, if you're interested in this, I would definitely go to them. Some of these are so interesting. These books are just fascinating to read. So you'll, you'll enjoy just reading them. There's another thing you can look up, and that is distribution maps, surname di distribution maps. So for the region that you're looking at, like if it's England or if it's, you know, Sussex County or something, not all the counties have these. But check under di surname distribution maps for the county or for the region that you're looking for. And this is true in Europe, too. You can get those in for Europe. And what they do is they will teach you how to, I mean, they will tell you where the names are located with the most um, people. Like my Hicken name, I looked that up on a surname distribution map. And on the modern map, it's still mostly in Leicester where my uh, people came from. Most of them tend to be more modern rather than uh, ancient, but some of them you can actually get some ancient surname maps. So those are really interesting. Now, the other thing I want to point out on my bibliography is down at the bottom. See the familysearch.org research wiki article. Now, I always have to plug the wiki because it is the best tool you have for any kind of research that you're doing in any country that you're doing it in. So research wiki articles, they all have in, in England and a lot of other countries too, they have naming customs on the right-hand side in the, in the articles for the topics. There's a naming customs. It talks even about the county naming customs. So each region or, or uh, county or country even, you know, because Ireland is its own country, in the British Isles, look at those, uh, look at those articles. They're, they're very basic. They're not, they're not as, as uh, you know, detailed as the things that I've got up here and the, those other ones, but it's very basic, but it's very good. And it gives you uh, the names and the patterns, uh, the naming patterns and different things about their names and where they got their names, patronymics and things like that. Okay. So you'll go to that. And then on each page of those naming customs, there'll be links to other places you can go to find out more detailed information as well. So the, the, the research wiki articles are really, really good. Now, the other thing you want to look at is on the Internet Archive. Um, these are all some of the ones that say on the Internet Archive. Some of them are out of print. If they're on the Internet Archive, you can just search the name of the book and it will come up and you can find it. The Book of Irish Names is really good for Irish names. It's got a list of Irish names. There's uh, Surnames of Wales is really good. And uh, the names and naming patterns in England is really good for that. American given names, I put that there because most American given names are British for given names. So that's really good uh, book too. And the other one is Scottish forenames. That one has a, a list of good names. So these are really super good books. I really highly recommend if you that you just take a look at them. They're fun to read as well and very interestingly written. That one when Scottish when Scotland was Jewish is awesome. Even if you don't have Jewish ancestry, it's so interesting. 